No one wants to talk about sin, nor do we want to talk about righteousness. Mostly, we talk about how to be more comfortable, more prosperous, and more self-righteous. As we talk about seven sacrifices, let's talk about the sin offering. So the sin offering was offered as an atonement for sin. Now, we talked a little bit last week about the burnt offering and how it was not to be eaten. Another offering that was not to be eaten, and, and please understand the reason I come back to that point, is that most of them were to be eaten. But the, the sin offering was not to be eaten because there was not to be any pleasure in that sacrifice for sin. You, you know, we, I, you, you come to the altar and repent. That's accepting Jesus Christ's atonement for your sin. It's not supposed to be a time when you're celebrating your sin. Now, is there joy? Yes. Does it lift a huge weight off you when you turn your life over to Christ? Yes, it does. But the sacrifice itself was not to be consumed. It was to take on your sins. And so that was, that was not the case. Now, we have the, the um, communion process or the, you know, like Jesus did the Last Supper and he talks about unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood and and all of that so that ties very much into sacrifice and of course he was the sin sacrifice but uh, I'm just saying you weren't supposed to take the sin sacrifice put it on the altar burn it and make barbecue and then eat it that wasn't supposed to happen that was disconnecting the pleasure side from from the sacrifice um, thus also the offering for sin was to be completely burned by fire, completely burned up, used up completely, okay? And that's really kind of a, a shadow of the idea that we're not supposed to hang on to part of that sin. See, one of the problems we have, and we've, we've probably amplified that over the, you know, the last 30 years or so in the churches, is that we don't want to deal with sin. We don't want to deal with the bloodshed of, uh, of Christ for our sins. So we don't really want to talk about the, the atonement and the sacrifice. Uh, we also don't want to really let go of the things that we're, we were sinning about. Well, you know, it's, it's hard to, you know, keep from sinning. Well, yes, it is. But if we are serious about our salvation, if we're serious about ceasing the sin, the offering for our sin needs to be completely burned by fire. We need to be completely disconnected from it. Now, if you look at things like uh, 12 Steps and, and those type programs, they, they talk about uh, things like you have to hit rock bottom. You have to hit the bottom before you can uh, really get better. And, and that's kind of the same thing as saying you have to be done with it. You have to get to a place where you're, you're I'm done. I, I can't do this anymore. So your sin offering, when you brought your sin offering, was going to be completely burned by fire. It was not something you were going to hang on to. It was, it was going to be completely gone. Now, the sacrifice, the sin offering, was a sacrifice of righteousness. And in Psalms 4, uh, verse 5, it says, Offer the sacrifices of righteousness and put your trust in the Lord. There, there's no other place that you can get your righteousness than from the Lord. You need to trust in the Lord. Not trust in yourself. Not, I, I can do this on my own. Not, there's many ways to heaven. No, there's one way to God, and that's through His Son, Jesus Christ. Trust in the Lord. That is my righteousness. He is my righteousness. Because my righteousness is insufficient. And 
And then you get to those that would try and debate that. Well, I, you know, maybe my righteousness really isn't insufficient. You know, I'm a good person. I pay my tithes. I give to the poor. I help the less fortunate than myself. I, I treat people well. I, I treat them the way I want to be treated. Uh, you know, I'm just, I'm a pretty wonderful human being. Um, if you think that, you're completely out of step with, with the reality of what the Bible says about your sin and what the Bible says about your righteousness. And what it says is your righteousness is insufficient, period, by definition. The rules say you can't do it on your own. You have to come through Christ. So the sin offering is an offering in atonement for your sin. And one of the things you did in the sin offering is you laid your hand on the head of the animal and you made a confession. So essentially you transferred or confessed your sins, transferred to that animal that was then going to die for your sins. Now, as I said last week, we don't have, you know, sacrifices going on in the, in, you know, in the church with, you know, bloodshed of uh, animals and all that kind of stuff, nor am I advocating that we should, because we have the new covenant, the new testament. We have the new sacrifice in that Jesus Christ has already taken care of it. We have to accept it. And so how do we, how do we talk about the sin offering? Well, we come forward, we confess, we get saved. And then unlike a fairy tale, it doesn't all go happily ever after and you never have another problem in your life and you never are tempted and you never have any sin issues. No, you can still sin. You just need to come back and offer that sacrifice, that confession to God and say, God, you know, I, this, is, this is my sin that I've done and I'm sorry. And I bring that to you. And, and I ask you to just, again, cover me and thank you for the sacrifice that took care of that. Forgive me. We ask forgiveness. Forgive me, God. Now, in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 8, uh, we're looking at the seven churches here. It says, And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things says the first and the last, who is dead and came to life. I know your works, tribulation, and poverty, but you are rich, and I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear any of these things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. And that's verses 8 through 11 in chapter 2 there. It, it says to the church in Smyrna, I see all the stuff you've got going on. Get the victory. That's literally kind of the translation there. Get the victory. What he's saying, overcome, get the victory. That's kind of like, can you just get the concept that it's all been taken care of through Christ? Now, that's my paraphrase, not, not uh, any translation, but, but it is the idea overcoming is get the victory. Well, what's the victory? That's what Christ did. That's how I get the victory. So when I accept Christ and I make him Lord, then I have overcome. Why? Is it because of something I did? No, it's because of what he did. I simply accepted it. That's part of the sin offering is get the victory, right? Bringing offering, you know, they had different offerings for your sin and all that. But the idea was you could get the victory uh, with your sin offering. And the idea in the New Testament is that you can get victory. You can overcome by the word of your testimony, by the blood of the Lamb, Jesus Christ. So by his blood that was shed and by your testimony, that's how we overcome and get the victory. And then we do not have to fear the second death. 
There's no fear of the second death, the death that comes later. What death is that talking about? It's the death related to sin. Now, a door for sin. I talked last week about the, the seven deadly sins. The second deadly sin is gluttony. And you go, what does gluttony have to do with my sin offering? Well, I told you one of the problems with the sin offering or one of the issues with the sin offering or one of the facts about the sin offering was it was not to be consumed. Um, it's kind of the opposite of gluttony, huh? Uh, but gluttony is really the idea of excessive eating, nonstop or eating too much, etc. That's the idea of gluttony. Now, I'm probably, you know, here in America, I'm probably treading on thin ice talking about gluttony because, um, you know, I know for a fact, I've been in church a long time, there are a lot of full gospel preachers, if you will. Um, they do pretty well on, on what they're eating. And so, you know, it makes them uncomfortable when you talk about gluttony. You can talk about smoking, drinking, whatever, but, you know, too much food, mm. Not so good. But what is gluttony really when, it, when you look at it? It's, it's um, first of all, excessive eating can be a source of joy. You can eat because you just enjoy food. And what that's basically saying is I can enjoy things to excess in order to try and replace the joy that I'm supposed to get from God. We eat comfort foods when we're stressed. We sometimes eat in order to calm ourselves down. We eat in order to uh, build ourselves up. We eat in order to uh, just, you know, derive our, our pleasures and our, our source of, of joy from those things instead of being able to trust God. You might find that a little bit of a stretch. It's really not, but you might find it that way. I'm simply telling you that that when you start going to other things, whatever it is, for your joy instead of going to God, you're never going to get enough of whatever that other thing is to keep you happy. And it is going to lead you into a situation of sin where you're trusting in things and not God. I'll give you an example of that type of thing. Someone comes home from work and says, it has been one of those days I really need a drink. Where are you trusting? I'm trusting in my drink. No, you should be trusting in your God. And part of it, the excessive eating thing, can be a fear of lack. You fear that you're not going to have enough. And that too is not trusting in God. It's, it's being fearful because you don't believe God is going to be able to supply all your needs. Even though that's what his word says, you start thinking, well, maybe he won't. It is, gluttony is, is a indication of a need to trust. I need to trust God. I need to trust God for my supply. I need to trust God for my strength. I need to trust God for my peace. I need to trust God for my joy. It's really simple. Trust God. In fact, I think I said that when I talked about the sacrifice of righteousness, I said, trust in the Lord. Um, and then we're talking about things that maybe cause us not to trust in the Lord. But today's worldview is kind of the idea of I am self-sufficient. It's all about my righteousness. I'm self-sufficient, but we approach it kind of through groupthink, right? It's I am enough and I have sufficiency as long as I get a whole bunch of other people to think and do the same thing I do as a group, then, then, then we're all self-sufficient. When I was growing up and um, we had, all, you know, all the uh, hippie movement and, and all of that, I always chuckled because they had this saying, do your own thing. Which sounds really independent. Do your own thing. But the only thing that they really would accept you doing was what 
all of the rest of them were doing. So it was more do your own thing as long as it's the same thing that everybody else is doing, then it's okay. That's what I mean by self-sufficiency through groupthink. Today, we don't say it that way. We don't say do your own thing. We say, you know, be your own, be your own person. We say if it feels good, do it. We say, um, you know, we need to care for our fellow man. Uh, all good sounding phrases and things. But the reality is, again, if you don't think the same way as the people who are kind of the leaders, if you will, in the movement, then you're ostracized because you're not doing the same thing that they are. You're doing your own thing, so to speak. And, and the other thing about today's society is that we kind of have excess in all that we do. We excess on everything. It's crazy. And, you know, it's some of that you can even see like through social media where, you know, there's someone puts a video out and it, it goes viral, right? All these people are clicking on it and talking about it and, and everything. And it's, it's just, it's, you know, it's crazy. There's, there's a million views or 2 million views or whatever. And it's, it's just an, an excessive amount of exposure for that particular video. And, you know, you could talk about it from a marketing concept. I'm not opposed to, you know, that that's how it goes, but, but that's how everything happens. Right. So we have shortage of this or shortage of that. Why? Because everybody all jumped on the same bandwagon on the same day. We have shifts in how we view activities that have gone on for years and years and years and years because something went viral in social media and it's trending now. And uh, so all of a sudden, everybody's got to got to change the way they think. Everybody's got to change the way they do things, because it's it's got to fit in the new model. You know that uh, Apple comes out with a new phone, and there's people camped out for days so they can buy the new phone. To me, that's excessive, right? I'm I'm I'm. I guess I'm just not that hooked into my phone. I mean, I, I, I have a phone and I do carry it with me and I probably futz with it more often than any phone I ever owned previously. And so, you know, I'm kind of guilty of being tied into that world. But I think we have, have reached a point of excess in a lot of this stuff. And the one thing we're not being excessive about is trusting God. The one thing we're not being excessive about is putting our our faith and our hope in God. So, as we look at today's lesson, can we talk about sin? I would ask you this. Do you trust the Lord with your sin? Do you trust the Lord enough to admit you have sin? Do you trust the Lord enough to put it in his hands and just say, God, I, I trust you and I, and I ask you to forgive me for my sin. Let him completely consume that sacrifice. Don't go pick it up. Don't hold anything back. God, these are my sins and I give them to you. Don't go back and pick them up. If you even are tempted to go and pick them back up, immediately say, God, I give this back to you. I, I, I was, I was going to pick it up. Can't believe I was being that stupid. I really am done with this, God. I give it to you. I trust in you. We get lost in trusting in medicine or we trust in television or we trust in social media or we trust in activities that we you know we trust in our hobby or we trust in our our wine tasting or we trust that we trust in all of these things but we don't trust in our god so our first two pieces to the seven sacrifices that we've covered last week and this week talks about a sacrifice a burnt offering to sacrifice for faith and then we talk about 
a sacrifice here that also needs to be a completely consumed offering, and it's a sacrifice for sin. Talks about the confessional side of, of things. We confess our sin as we lay hands on the head of that, um, that sacrificial lamb, if you will. But we have to trust, not doubt, not fear, and be like the church in Smyrna. Get the victory. Overcome. How? By the blood of the lamb, by the word of our testimony, by putting our trust in God, by not letting go, but just continuing to trust. That's the way we do it. That's the answer to how we get it done. Can we talk about sin? Yes, we can talk about the fact that I can be free from sin if I can trust God and if I can accept his sacrifice. And then I can tell the world of what he's done for me. That's my testimony. And when I do that, I can be an overcomer. I can get the victory. And I don't have to worry about the second death. I hope you'll take a little bit of time this morning and you'll just ponder in your heart. You'll talk to God. You'll talk to him about the sin offering that may or may not be ne needed in your life today. You'll let him have it all, whatever it is. You'll give it all to him and just like uh, quit playing games. Just let it all go and trust God. Accept what he's done. And that's it for this week.